If you're visiting with us, welcome this morning. We are picking up our discipleship um, series for this first part of the year where we're, we've kind of launched or we are launching a thing we call our People Building Project. And part of that is to really take the first part of the year to really wrestle, what is this thing called discipleship all about? What is it? What does Jesus mean when he calls us to come follow him? What does that look like fleshed out in the body of Christ? So we've been looking at that, and then we're going to uh, move into something talking about community. What does community look like in our microchurch ministry? What does it look like to be the body of Christ um, outside of a larger gathering, in a smaller home setting um, to connect? We just want to do what obviously we see done in the book of Acts, where they met as a large group. They broke up in each other's homes, and that's where they actually broke bread together and worshiped and um, got into the word and served and encouraged each other. So these are some of the things that we'll be here at the beginning of the year kind of diving into. And again, if you have any questions at all as far as what's going on, different ministries, different ways to plug in, please let us know. We'd love to um, connect with you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6 this morning, and uh, we're going to talk about learning to live in the kingdom of God. And we've been journeying with Jesus and the disciples. A couple weeks ago, we looked at chapter 5 of Luke itself, where Jesus called, started calling his disciples. And we looked at when he called Peter and Andrew and James and John and the fishermen to come follow him. So just a little context that's important to understand is that um, the, this group of disciples at this stage was a large group of people um, that followed him. They followed him kind of wherever he went. And uh, so this was this large group of disciples. And we see that in chapter five, part of this journey is he called the fishermen to come follow him. They were part of this larger group. And then uh, later in chapter five, he calls Levi, he calls the, uh, Matthew, the tax collector, come follow this, this larger group. And as we move into chapter six, we see that um, it's still remaining this larger group. And what we're gonna see happens in chapter six is Jesus prays all night and he calls out of that larger group of disciples his 12 apostles, the 12 that would actually lead the church and be his inner circle of leaders that would carry on, right, the mission of the church and obviously carry on his work of making disciples and having that spread out as well as planting churches um, around the world. And so that's what we're going to pick up this morning in, um, in verse 12. But let me just do a little intro for us on that. Um, before we get into this and this idea of what Jesus, we're going to actually look at some hard stuff here in the sense that it's, uh, it's challenging. And um, lots of what Jesus said was very challenging. And he never, for the most part, you never see Jesus oftentimes explain it. He leaves it with us to have to wrestle with. And the reason he does that is because he wants to call people out of the crowd to who's really seeking, who's really willing to take the time to wrestle, right, internally with, with what's going on. And um, I, I think what's happened a lot of the time, I know, especially in this crazy year that we've been in, is, um, boy, it's easy to start just living on the fumes of faith, isn't it? Anybody relate to that? You just kind of, throughout life, it's, you go the seasons where you feel like you're just living on fumes, Right, that there's just the reality of the joy of knowing the Lord, the joy of, uh, of reading his Bible, just the, the, uh, the passion to read it, the passion to serve him. It just fades away, and we're just kind of living on fumes. We might still come to church, but, man, we're just feeling kind of disconnected. And the more we read the Bible and we see the promises of God and we see the early church, how they lived, this gap between what we read and what we're actually experiencing, it, we feel it growing, and, and we just can move into this place of, of just kind of living on fumes, right? Um, and uh, this is what Jesus deals with. And this is what discipleship is all about, is it changes the context when we are struggling with things, especially in the faith, it's discipleship, right? That it's in that context where we get real. We're in a smaller group of, of people, a group of women, a group of men, with somebody leading that who's obviously been down the line, who's more mature, where we can be honest with our questions, be honest with our heart and with what is going on and encourage right, people, each other, right, in that promise, in, those, uh, in that process, and we take the word of God here and we teach. Discipleship is learning how to live in the kingdom of God. And we're gonna see Jesus 
This whole, it's a massive reversal. What he came to call us into was the kingdom of God. And it's a, it's a radical different way of living. It's a radical different way of looking at life than normal. And that's what he saved us out of. It's into this life of learning how to live right in the kingdom. And discipleship is the context of being followers of Jesus and learning to actually lay hold of these promises, learning to, how to live for the testimony, learning how to share our faith and, and for that faith, not just to be fumes, but for it to be a fire, for it to be a fire. And folks, we need desperately in the church, right? And among, I think if we're all honest, we're either in fumes now or we have struggled, right? And we're looking for the fire. We're looking for that, that Pentecost, that day of the Spirit of God coming, the pr- reality, the presence of God in our life, the reality of the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy, uh, the reality of just our walk with God. We're looking for the fire. And, and we're in a, a stage right now, right in the American church, where there's a whole turning, a whole you know, thinking or reviewing things. And, and I think what God is doing is, is always before revival, there is this awakening, there is a repentance, there is a, a getting serious with an evaluation of where are we really at? And is the presence of God really among us? Do we really have the fire of God? Do we really have relationship? Is my affection with God growing? Right, an honest assessment of these things. And, and I think part of that repentance is realizing that as Americans, we can't do it alone. This idea of independent spirituality is nowhere uh, in the Bible. And we've tried that route. And we've tried the route of just, you know, kind of using the things of the world, right, to spark faith. And, and what the kingdom, what, what Jesus is calling his disciples into is understand kingdom living, that all the th- blessings of the world, what nice buildings, lights, bells, whistles, maybe great teaching and maybe a phenomenal worship team and, and, and all of these great things, none of that, none of that in and of itself brings about faith formation. All of that is the things of the world that we can harness for God. But what Jesus is teaching here is that outside of him, outside of his presence, right, that, that we, we just get busy, right, and, and, and kind of fake ourselves out, right? Uh, someone has said that entertainment in America is the great substitute for a lack of joy. And folks, we've done the same thing in the church, we try to just pump ourselves up with more, well, you know, louder music, you know, greater, you know, uh, stars or greater buildings or uh, you just go down the list of things, right? Greater organization, greater programs, on and on and on. And all along, the real question is, where's the faith formation? Are people growing as disciples? Are we truly entering into this kingdom Right, living that Jesus calls it. He saved us into this. Are we really laying hold of the promises of God in our lives and getting God's heart right for what he wants to see happen right in the world? And uh, this is primarily at the, at the core of, of what discipleship's all about. But I think what happens is that, <clears throat> I don't think I know from my own experience too, right, is this chasm and this, this just getting to a place of living on the fumes is, is that, boy, we get discouraged, right? And we think, well, God, why is God not answering these things? And we just get numb and we get to a place where, you know, our faith in reality, if we were to really look at our lives, has our faith actually grown? Has our faith been formed to be like Christ? How, are we more passionate about God? Are we seeing and having the testimonies of his word coming in alive in our life? These are the kind of questions that need to take place in spiritual formation inside discipleship. They cannot and do not happen in the larger settings of program and larger church. This is why Jesus right, laid the model out for us right, of, of discipleship. So I want to just, before we get in here, I want to just give you a little saying to hold on to as we journey this morning. And just an encouragement, right? And this is what needs to be uh, modeled within our discipleship to help us along and encourage us. We need to be patient with the unresolved issues of our heart and our life, right? And patient and learn to live by the Spirit of God. That's what disciples is all about. I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, if there's a problem, whether it's a relational problem, an emotional problem, uh, you find it, you go down the problem list, I, I, I want to just get in and fix it. Whatever the world has you know, for me, I'm going to utilize it. Let's just get this problem fixed. And um, 
in the course of discipleship, as we're going to see, is Jesus, he didn't resolve very much. He gave huge teaching out to people, right? He never coddled people. It's something we have to understand. We have a wrong therapeutic view of Jesus. That's not how he operated. I challenge you to find anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus coddled people. He threw down some serious teaching and he left it there. Matter of fact, the only time he ever explains anything is when his disciples were desperate and they came to him and said, Jesus, you know, why couldn't we heal this person? Only a few times do we see Jesus actually explain what Jesus' point of doing was to lay this out for his disciples so that this right here, that we would come to a place as we're gonna see of being poor in spirit. We're desperate to seek God and let the Holy Spirit, now who's inside us, come alive and to hear from his voice. But unfortunately, Bonhoeffer dealt with this long ago in Germany, right? He called it cheap grace, is that much of the church, this goes back to, to you know, Germany, right, to... Um, a long time ago that this is nothing new under the sun is that people would come and we're all, our faith would stop when it comes to salvation. Our faith would stop when it comes to the basics of just listening, kind of intellectual faith. It would stop right there. And that's what Bonhoeffer called, this is cheap grace. This is receiving God, right, for salvation. But listen carefully, as Bonhoeffer said, but unwilling to step into discipleship. Cheap grace, I'm willing to accept God's blessing in my life and be a part of the larger aspect, but I'm not willing to step into discipleship. And discipleship is where our faith is formed. This is exactly why, again, if you look at all statistics in the American church today, you have masses of people showing up for the entertainment, for the show, right? To go through the religious process. And if that's all they do, faith is formed very little. Again, you look at the stats and again, um, the majority of people who claim to be Christians in America, their life and their worldview is nowhere close to what the Bible says. Nowhere close. And the only way that that, that can happen is if there's this gap and unwilling to step into discipleship. So our faith is formed. We encourage each other, right? Which is what Jesus modeled right for us right here. So does this statement make, make sense, folks? Is that I think we too quickly, we get like, man, I... And we jump out to worldly solutions rather than taking the time. Or we get just this pressure, this religious pressure of, I, I have to force something in my life. I have to force a testimony. I have to force resolution in my life rather than being at peace. And this is what Jesus, he just walked with. He's, he's asking us to follow him in, 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 a, in a, 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 a peaceful and restful relationship, trusting God is gonna speak to us. He's going to resolve our unresolved issues in our life, if we trust him, he promises he will in his time, in his way, right? And, uh, and so I think just in, I, and this is kind of the grace we need to show each other is we're all in a different path. Just the grace to journey with each other rather than try to step in and fix a problem, right? Or try to kind of throw down the theological billy club is, man, let's have grace to journey with each other in the sense of let's let God speak, and that means there should be more time, as we're going to see here, of, in prayer and preparation and just listening to God. Lord, you speak. You've got to come in. You've got to, to deal with these issues, right? So with that said, let me uh, read for us. This is Luke chapter 6, starting verse 12. We'll go through verse 26 this morning. It says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. So, a few weeks ago, we talked about the importance of, of at fundamentally, discipleship's important that we learn how to pray together, pray for each other, pray with expectation. Remember, it was the disciples who asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. It's in that context that we really learn how to pray. And it says, when day came, he called his disciples, the larger group, and he chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Simon, whose name's Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus. And Simon, who was called the Zealot. And Judas, the son of James. And Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. And he came down with them, and he stood on a level place. And with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people, from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. So this is a, a large group of people. And you had three groups here. You had his 12, 
You have a larger group of disciples. Later on, you see he sent out 72 of his disciples. This is part of the larger group. And then a larger group of people who are just the crowd, right? Check, and you read through the gospels and you always see um, this, this language of Jesus speaking to the crowd and his, his avenue was always to the crowd and to hope that people would step out of the crowd right into a context of following him in discipleship, right? And again, I, I say this all the time, but I think it's for all of us is such a huge awakening to understand Jesus did not pander to the crowd. He wasn't about building a crowd. Matter of fact, when the crowd, and this is 100% of the time in the gospels, when the crowd got larger, Jesus' message got stronger. It's just the opposite of what the American church has done. And, 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 And that should really, we should personally think about that. Because as we're gonna look about, Jesus doesn't coddle anybody. Oh, he's tender, loving, and affectionate. Don't get me wrong there. But when it comes to wrestling with spiritual reality and truth, Right? It, it requires us to step out and to deal with the hard stuff, which we're going to see some of it here this morning. Right? And to be honest with our soul, he's looking for genuine seekers, people to step into discipleship and learn what it is to lead, live in this kingdom and walk in our faith formed right, by the Holy Spirit right, in our lives. And uh, unfortunately, the context we're in is that culture has just consumed us, right? And it's, and it's left many, right, in the church without their faith form. Decades of being involved in church, but their faith, in reality, not really advancing much at all. Um, and, and boy, this is, we have to recover, right, this here. And so, let's read on. So there's a great crowd of his disciples and the multitude of other people who were there. And all the crowd, verse 19, sought to touch, oh, let me step back, sorry, verse 18. And they came to hear him. And he healed and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Remember, Jesus always modeled the fullness of ministry, which was the spoken word, the truth of God, right? The preaching of the word, but also the ministry of the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, we, we, you got to have both. And that's what we we seek for. And and we should grow hungry when we don't see both happening, when we don't see the power of God. We don't see God's people growing in their gifts and serving, right, by the power of God, each other to see things like this, right? Again, what did Jesus teach his disciples to do? Exactly what he did, minister, right, to the brokenness of people, not just their soul and their spirit, but their entire body to set them free. In verse 20, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. So it's shifting. This message now is not for the crowd that's listening. This is primarily for the disciples. Again, here's the context. Church should not be primarily for the crowd. Church is the gathered ecclesia of the body of Christ. The message primarily, always in scripture, was for who? The disciples, right? With the crowd present and hoping that there would be a spark of, of, of some Um, desire, right, to step in and take hold of of this truth. And this is what Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor. And Luke here means poor, physically poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, Jesus says, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the prophets. The word of God. I don't know about you, but if I'm the one of the disciples, you have to understand how radical a message this was. Radical. We, have, we just immediately put it through this filter of, 
We don't let it land and really wrestle with the magnitude of what Jesus is, is calling us to. I don't know about you, but um, man, I, I, I don't want to be poor. And by the way, guess what? None of us are poor. We're all rich. We're the wealthiest people who have ever lived on the face of the planet. I, I like Jesus. I don't want to be poor. Remember, all the old time, all Jewish people came to, their mindset worldview was that wealth was a blessing from God. And Jesus, you're sitting there saying, what? All the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they were all wealthy. Look at Abraham, look at Job, look at all the Old Testament context. So they're coming with this idea of, and Jesus tells them, man, blessed are the poor, for theirs is, present tense, possession, the kingdom of God. What, what does that mean? And what does that mean for, for us who are rich and for those who are listening who are rich? He doesn't explain. He doesn't coddle anybody. He leaves it. He leaves it for people to go and to wrestle for this, to get hungry and to what does that mean for me, Jesus? How, how can I be blessed? Right, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to be hungry now. I've never really gone hungry. Blessed are you if you're hungry. Wow, you, you will be satisfied. What, the, what, does, what does that mean? Blessed are you who weep. I don't want to weep. I mean, we've had enough of that. Let's, I, I want laughter and joy, right? What's he getting at here? And, and how about this last one? Wow, blessed are you when people hate you for the name of Jesus. Then he says, leap for joy. I mean, this is tough stuff. But the question is, and this is exactly today, this morning, and, and oh, oh, it's no different than back then. He's laying out there, who wants the kingdom of heaven? Who wants my promises? Who wants to learn to live by the kingdom and the power of the Holy Spirit? Who wants that? Who's willing to wrestle? Who's willing to be patient with these unresolved issues? Who's be willing to be patient in discipleship with these crazy questions and, and, and let the Holy Spirit Show us what it means for us. See, discipleship, it, it, Jesus never says you gotta know everything. Good luck with that. But he does say to follow me, there must be a sense of being poor. There must be a sense of great need. It must be a sense of humility. It must be a sense of, Lord, I don't know. And nothing the world offers will suffice. Nothing, right? And... Um, I just want to walk through uh, some of these um, and just give you four things, four key questions that, that we need to, and I'm just skimming the surface here. This is a lifetime of discipleship. Even when you think, and I've studied it pretty in depth and over the years, and I keep coming back to it, and it disturbs me every time I read it. Are you okay with being disturbed, convicted by the word of God? This is another problem today, right? We, we want our ears tickled. We think where a crowd is, that means God's at work. We think I want to be, I want to be feeling good. I, I, want, I, want to be, I want something to make me feel good. Well, I ask you to read, read the Gospels. Did Jesus, was he worried about making people feel good? Just show me anywhere. You see how much we've consumed culture and how it's given us a lens where it's kept us numb from really pursuing and laying hold of what Jesus radically has to offer us now. This is a present promise. The kingdom is yours now. But there's a requirement. You gotta become poor. You gotta become poor. <sighs> what does that mean, right? So um, I'll come back to that. Let me just give another little context here before we break this down. <clears throat> there's several things in this section. There's a lot, but I just wanna touch on a couple um, that are important here. And I already touched basically on prayer. Folks, if Jesus had to pray all night, if he prayed all night before he chose his 12, that big decision, what about in our life? Quantity does matter, right? In other words, if I'm not hearing from God, you know what does he say? He says, ask, seek, knock. That's a progression. If I'm asking, I'm not getting there, he says, seek. And I'm not getting there, knock. Let's just, I gotta go at it. Who, he's looking for those who by faith are poor in spirit. In other words, come to a place of desperation. My resources, what, I, what the world has to offer is not gonna suffice for any of my issues. I need God. 
And this is where we all should be when it comes to church is that, man, we can throw great programs. We can do all the bells and whistles, but man, our primary thing should be, God, are you here? Are we pleasing you? Are you moving with supernatural power to change people's lives, to bring your hope and salvation and, and growth and faith formation? That's what should grip our hearts, right, in this whole thing. The other thing I want to point out is this crazy group of people that he chose. Out of this larger group, he prays all night, and he chooses his 12 apostles to carry the flag, the stick, for the church, right? Um, to be his leaders, to carry on discipleship with others, plant churches, all that, all that stuff we read about in the book of Acts. And I just want to point out two characters because it's very applicable. And, um, well, we could get off on a big tangent. I just want to let this land with you to think about. I want to point out two characters. One, he called Matthew to be his inner circle. Do you know who Matthew was? Matthew was a tax collector. That means that he was in bed with the Romans. He was deep in. He was deep, deep in, right, with the government at the time, the reigning Romans, right? And he would actually turn his own people in, right? In collecting taxes, he would abuse them. He would take more tax than was needed. I mean, it was, he was hated, right, among his own people. He was a traitor, but he was all about being deep in, right, uh, with the government. The other guy here is Simon the Zealot. You know what a zealot was? And folks, I, this is just amazing to me. You look at, these are the people that Jesus called to equip and make it be disciples to lead the way of the kingdom. A zealot, folks, was somebody who was an activist, who was all about overthrowing the Roman government, even with violence. Wow. That's why they called him the zealot. Matter of fact, in 70 AD, when the temples were destroyed, it was the zealots who caused a revolt against Rome. Now, let this settle for a minute. Just let it settle. This is his inner circle. You have one guy who's deep in the government, who's a traitor turning his own people in, and the other guy you have is an activist that has, in the past, right, been a part of violence to overthrow the government. I will leave with you the application. But what I want to point out is that Jesus had both of these people in his discipleship. He had, a, a, and if, if, if Simon found Matthew in an alley, he would have put him away. They couldn't be on two different perspectives more radically apart. And, and, and he had them in his group. Can you imagine the discussions going on? And so I just want to leave you with this in discipleship is this idea of what God can do. And, and this is a message we need to have in the church. We need to have grace for each other. This cancel culture that's going on out there, the problem with it is sooner or later, you cancel, you're going to get canceled. And we're seeing it happen. It'll come right back at you. It's ugly, right? We need to have the churches needs to be the model. No one else can do this. The community here has to be the model of grace. The honoring of different perspective, no matter how radical it is. And Jesus took these two extreme places and through time, guess what? He brought them to a place of godliness. He brought them to a place of health. He got them to work in unity and shed all that extreme ungodly stuff and follow him and give a glorious testimony. Folks, what in the world is going on in the church today? The backbiting, the gossip, the, the utter inability to even talk or, or under, sit down and understand somebody else's perspective. It's only the church. If the church can't do it, guess what? We're in big trouble. There's no other context. Should be real clear to you if you're tuned into politics at all. No other context can bring about unity. No other context can bring about this kind of, of healthy, grace for each other to work it out and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to shed those rough edges, right? And it's going to bring health and healthy community to the process. Does that make sense, gang? I, I leave that with you to, to just think about in the context of, wow, what is going on in our culture today? Look at the two people that were in his inner circle. Wow, he had some serious work to do with these guys, Right? And obviously for them to get this far, they'd already, you know, were having to think about their perspective. And, and this is where I think for both of them, they had to wake up. When he called Matthew and he called Simon the Zealot, 
somewhere in there, there had to be this sense of humble humility and a sense of, you know, as strong as, let's go Simon, as strong as I feel about what needs to be done, I know that no, matter, no amount of activism is going to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Is there a God great enough that can do what no man or government can do? Right? And I have to believe for Matthew, there was a sense of the same thing, of seeing there's got to be a better way. And would there be anybody who, after all of my be, basically being a traitor or, or just being so deep involved in, quote, the local government, would, would there be anybody who would show me grace? Yeah, there's only one place, right? So just, i just lay that out for you to kind of think about. Our first thing here, this idea of when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, there is the kingdom of God, is the question in discipleship that we really need to wrestle with is, man, am I growing in spiritual authority? Am I growing in spiritual authority? And, and, and folks, this only happens when we're willing to lock arms. And, and again, Brian gave testimony last week. I can give testimony. Is the times where my faith has soared, right? It's always been in the context where I am in tight fellowship, tight discipleship with other men, keeping each other accountable, pushing each other on together to go after the things of God. Without it, your, our faith will not be formed. We'll gain some intellectual knowledge. Oh yeah, we'll get a little thing here, a little thing there. But we will not accomplish what Jesus calls us to, right? Of what's available, right, to us. And it's this issue of spiritual authority and the reality is, folks, if I'm so focused on the authority, on the things of the world, I will never lay hold of spiritual authority. If I think that, that the world is gonna change by worldly power, worldly fame, worldly wealth, I will never experience the power of God. The kingdom of God, when it advances, guess what? It does not need wealth, fame, right, or power, or, or, or worldly power. Matter of fact, if you just look at the Bible itself, why did Jesus choose these people? Why does he say, I came for the poor? To make a point, which Paul makes over and over again, right, is, is simply that he chose, right, the weak things to confound the wisdom of the wise. He says, power requires someone, whether they have physical wealth or not, right, to be broken and dependent on him. I think the greatest explanation of, of what Jesus said here, he says later on in this, in, um, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 13, verse 44, and Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that was buried in a field and a man found it. And when he found it, he covered it back up and he went out and he sold everything to buy that field. Now, the beauty of that parable is it explains both the idea of the poor and the rich here in the sense that um, we see this guy obviously had some wealth, Right? but he was seeking. How did he find the treasure? So you have a wealthy man who's able to buy this field and, and he, got, he, he, he woke up to realize is the things of the world aren't gonna satisfy. I don't need more barns, but I need to seek the kingdom of God. I need to seek the truth of God. And he was seeking and he found the treasure. And when he found it, what did he do? He leveraged all that he had to get that field. Everything, he leveraged all of his wealth, all of what he had to expand the kingdom of God. He still owned the field. Right? Not everybody's, Jesus doesn't ask everybody, divest everything, but he does ask everyone to become poor if we're going to be, be rich towards God. Right? And that looks different for all of us. Right? But fundamentally, Matthew says, poor in spirit. Right? For yours is the kingdom of God. To, to have the kingdom of God right, requires becoming poor. Right? And to, um, to embrace that. And so I, I, uh, I just kind of, or thought about this, and, and it looks different in all of our lives, gang. But I just encourage you, right, to think about this, and, and what does that look like? And, and pray that God would give you, right, and, and let us help you, right, in a context to really flesh this out. What does it look like, right, to be poor, to, to have that blessing, to be untethered? I love the language of abundance without attachment. If there's attachment in my life to my stuff, Right? It's impossible for me to lay hold of the kingdom and the power of the kingdom and of spiritual authority in my life. I have to be set free from that. 
It doesn't mean I have to give it all away or, or whatever, but you know what? Sometimes, like the rich young ruler, that might just be I need to divest. I know in my own life, it wasn't until I was in discipleship where I learned what giving, the power of giving. It wasn't until I was in discipleship and other men and other guys, we you know, revealed this and, and, and showed right the power of obeying when it came to giving. And that it's through giving, right, that the chains of, uh, of attachment are broken and God can move, right, in a powerful way. So this question of growing in, in spiritual authority is, boy, do you realize, and I could, again, I'm skimming the top here, but do you realize what the rest of the New Testament, the promises of God are, the kind of authority that Jesus expects us to walk in? Do you realize the kind of authority that's available to us? And again, God does not accomplish his purposes through the power, wealth of the world. Oh, when he gets a hold of a wealthy, powerful person, right? Is that person will leverage those things for the kingdom. But get this, folks, and I've seen this testimony over and over and over again. God will move. He is the owner of everything. And you know what? He will remove wealth or resources in one place and he'll move it to where he needs it. He's the one in charge. And when we start living with that kind of expectation in our life, we get free, right? In our own, in our own heart to walk in that, in that blessing. Second one, he says, blessed are those who hunger. Now, he says, and they will be satisfied, or they will be satisfied. And, and again, we see Jesus all through um, the New Testament. Remember, at the great feast, he stood up and he just screamed to the whole crowd, is anybody thirsty here? In fact, I believe that's what he's saying to the, for, to the church, to our church, to the church in America, loud as he can from heaven. Is anybody thirsty Hey, you Americans, the most wealthy people who've ever walked in the face, are you anybody truly thirsty? Is anybody willing to come after me? Is anybody really hungry for the things of God, for the kingdom of God? This is what Jesus is laying before us, right? To have to think, and it's in discipleship that we really have to challenge each other with this question. Man, am I, where's my appetite, right? Where is my appetite? And folks, I think another great question for us here is how do we, are, are we in tune with how much of the culture we are consuming? Are we in tune with how much of the culture has, have we consumed and has formed our thinking rather than the scripture? Again, it's in the context of discipleship we flesh this stuff out and get very practical with it, start analyze things, right? In the sense of why do I believe this way, certain way? Why do I have these politics? Why do I believe on this issue? Where does that come from? Is it because I've been consuming culture? Or is it because I've had time in the word of God, trusting God and letting the spirit of God speak to me, right? And encourage me. So what's our spiritual appetite, right? Am I hungry um, for, the things of, for the things of God? Um, and folks, whatever we feed is what's gonna grow. Whatever I feed in my life is what's gonna grow. And if I take entertainment to to replace a lack of joy, guess what's, what's gonna grow? The culture and nothing good. If I'm binging on Netflix or just go down the list of things, whatever it is, I'm feeding a certain thing in my soul. So whatever I feed is what is gonna grow. That's a universal principle. Does that make sense? And so another great discipleship question that we have to get into with each other is, man, what are you feeding? What in your life are you feeding? What do you expect? What do you want to grow in your life? right? And if I'm just consumed about getting rich, Paul had some harsh things about that, right? To, he said to Timothy, right? You'll throw yourself into great despair. Because guess what? All I'm feeding is things that are going to what? Vaporize, right? We'll never satisfy the more and more and more I get, you know? I had a chance this last weekend to be with some large group of people that I didn't know and who were some just incredibly successful, wealthy people. And they were, fa and, and at the same time, I can say it like this, probably some of the lost, most lost people I've ever been around. They were consumed with the things of the world, power, money, the next deal, with no desire whatsoever, right, to lay hold of the things of God. Not even asking questions, not even open to it to ask questions of, of their soul in all this. Man, it can get a hold of us, folks, if we're, not, if we're not engaging this conversation, right, with each other. So that's spiritual appetite, hunger. The third one is um, interesting. He says, wow, 
Those who weep will be blessed. Blessed are those who weep, for you will laugh with joy. And he goes on, right in the verse, we woe to you if you laugh now. And that laughter in the Greek means a laughter that's kind of like this, ah, we eat and drink, tomorrow we die. Or a laughter of, ha, I've got success, right? It's pretty much a laughter before God, though people wouldn't say that of, I'm just fine, I can do this on my own. A laughter that taking joy in the things of the world rather than the things of God. And the idea of weeping, folks, this idea of, of spiritual anguish is this wrestling with, are we growing in, in, in uh, getting in tune with the heart of God for, for how lost people are? In other words, the magnitude of what we're dealing with here is eternity. And are we getting the heart of God, right? Which, hey, how much did God love everybody? How much does God want everyone to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus? He sent his son. It, it, this is such a, a, a big issue to him. He put his son out there for us. How much more should we be in touch right, with the heart of God and be willing to step boldly, powerfully into people's lives, right? Remember, it was Jesus who wept over Jerusalem because of that they rejected God. They missed him. They missed God in their midst. And we see it was Jesus standing before Lazarus' tomb. He was weeping, not because, remember, he was getting ready to raise Lazarus. He was weeping because of the, of the result of sin is death. He was weeping because there'll be some people who do not receive Jesus, who would rather choose death and eternity away from God than to receive the free grace of Jesus. And that should rock our world, right? Where we should get um, spiritual empathy, right? For people's souls, right? And, and, and step in with bold love, right? Into people around us. And the final one, Folks, it's this idea of growing in spiritual affection. Um, man, I, this is such a big one. Jesus says, wow, blessed are you when people hate you. I mean, let, let that settle. We don't have time to do justice this morning, but what does that mean? And, and, and it says all kinds of evil things about you. And I think we need to all ask ourselves, has anybody rejected you because of your, not because of doing something stupid, <laughs> right? But simply because of you sharing Jesus. Has anybody rejected you because of your faith, because of your belief in Jesus as your savior? Blessed are you. And we see this theme over and over, right, in, in, in the scripture. And this is affection because it, at the core of it is, is that, man, am I consumed with obeying my Lord? Am I most consumed by, by pleasing Jesus, or am I consumed about pleasing the world, what the world thinks of me, right? Am I consumed about fitting in? And it says, whoa, woe to, the, to you when people speak well of you all the time. And folks, I think the church in America, we as a church, we need to wake up to this. Have we done our ministry being so seeker sensitive, so relevant out there because we're so consumed by what people think about us rather than telling the truth of God? And again, this whole, uh, this whole time is showing us we don't know how to receive rejection, good rejection. Jesus says, blessed are you when you make a stand for me. And he goes over and over again to say that we will be rejected, right? If we make a stand for him, there will be this, and even hatred for making a stand. And we're there today, folks. Right? We're there. And ultimately, again, in discipleship, the question has to be, man, who, where's my heart going? Is my heart growing in love for God? Because if it is, with that comes a greater visual of what the world is all about, right? And that I don't want that. We don't want that. And we see the darkness, right, that's behind that. And with that comes a rejection of what the church, what followers of Jesus stand for. And we need encouragement, right, with each other for that. And so just in closing, this back to this statement here, Oops, which way did I go? Um, I disappeared. But if you can bring up that, uh, that last little statement. Folks, it's discipleship. It's this process just being patient, working with each other, being patient, being gracious with each other, working this stuff out because this is unresolved, right? But folks, all it, what, this should, we should be stirred by this. It should cause us you know, some uncomfort inside our soul. That's good. That's good. If not, that's bad. It should. And, and, and how we work that out is with others. Like, hey, let's work this out. Let's pray through this, 
right? And encourage this, trusting that the Holy Spirit is gonna lead us and do great things in our lives and lead us into this whole radical new way of living, which is living in the kingdom of God, which is radically different than the kingdom of this world. He's called you out. If you know Jesus, he's called you out, right, into the kingdom of his son, a whole new way of living, right? And so just as we close, we're just gonna take some time um, before the Lord and, and uh, just, just rest before him and uh, ask him to speak to you and just to confirm if there's things that are coming up. And, you know, we all need encouragement. You know, it says when the body comes together, we need encouragement because all of us, we kind of get to that place sometimes, right, and often, right, where we're kind of living on the fumes of faith, right, rather than the fire. And we come together to, to spark each other, to encourage you. That's why the scripture says when you come, encourage you, use all the gifts to maximize that encouragement for each other. And uh, so I'm just gonna pray, and, and uh, before we come to the table here with each other, let's just let's enjoy his presence and ask him to come. So Father, thank you, Lord, for your word, and uh, Lord, that's hard stuff. Lord, we need you, we need your spirit to come and, and to reveal to us, speak to us very personally on this. Where are we at? Where are we at, God? When it comes to spiritual authority in our life, where are we at when it comes to spiritual hunger? our appetite for you, God, our anguish, Lord, our, our concern for what is happening in the world with people's souls. And Lord, when it comes to affection, Lord, where's my heart? Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll come. The demonstration of your power, Lord, right into our souls. Lord, show us how to encourage each other. Push each other along, Lord. It's never too late. We need to step in your arms are always open, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come now with your spirit, with your encouragement. Do your work deep inside our soul. We ask this in Jesus' name.